rally car, but from the outside, it really doesn't look like one. It's a 2006 Subaru STI Spec D. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. The original Subaru Impreza came out in 1992 and it was something of a hit because it was a massive smash on the world rally car stage. It was winning rallies, it was getting noticed, it was giving, it was, it was the ultimate halo model of an otherwise unremarkable but fairly capable car. The Mark 1 carried on until 2000 when it was replaced by the Mark 2 which was uh, well known for the um, not particularly nice bug eye front end which went down, well just so badly I think is the only way you can put that really, it was not well received. So fairly shortly after the Mark II came out, it was refreshed and got these new sycamore lights. I think they call them the sycamore seed lights because of the, sh the shape is like a sycamore seed. Anyway, this was also a very, very good car, but again, pretty much under the radar, only really loved by farmers, unless it had big gold wheels, big bumpers, air intakes, side skirts, all the loud boy racery stuff that made you a very antisocial yob on the road and you didn't really care because you had all that great stuff and you were having a good time. Anyway, in 2006, Subaru realized there was a market for people who had grown up with the Impreza, but had, well, grown up. They knew there was a market for cars that had all the performance, all the handling, the engine, all the good stuff that makes an STI an STI, but without the bright gold wheels, without the bright blue paint, a little bit more toned down, a bit more of a Q car. And so this is it, something that went from being a bit of baseball cap to a bit, tweed cap. So this is it, the 2006 Subaru Impreza STI Spec D. D stands for Q-Car, D stands for under the radar, D stands for discreet. I mean I say discreet, but it does still have this great big bumper with the canards and the lower splitter, the big air, air intake which you really can't ignore even from the driver's seat, it's right in your face all the time. And around the back, that spoiler isn't exactly uh, invisible either. But these cars were only available in crystal grey metallic or silver, and were only available with silver wheels as well, so they did blend in with traffic just a little bit more than the regular STIs would. Now they only made 300 of these, but under the skin they were exactly the same as a regular STI. It's only the outside that really changed, well a few things inside as well. Under the bonnet though, that is still the same. Let's have a quick look. We get the same two and a half litre flat fours we get in a regular STI. We've got all the usual STI accoutrements and gubbins. So we've got the intercooler on top, there's a turbo in there somewhere. It's all, you know, the usual package, which I think we're all familiar with. And the car's not heavy either. 1495 kilograms, which is not particularly heavy for a you know, mid-size family sedan. But the engine puts out 276 horsepower and 289 foot-pound of torque, which is plenty. That does mean it gives it a 0 to 60 in 5.3 seconds and a top speed of 158 miles an hour. Okay, so 5.3 isn't supercar territory, but the way this thing delivers the power is very exciting. We'll come on to driving the thing in a few minutes, but here, just for a moment, savour the, uh, the flat four. And of course, it's four wheel drive. I mean, technically this is longitudinally mounted because the camshaft runs front to back. Of course, this is a boxer engine, so the, the four cylinders are lying on their sides, to each side, firing out towards the wheels at either side of the car. Driving transmission back to the gearbox there and four wheel drive. There are three limited slip distance car, front, back and centre, sending the power exactly where it's needed. So this is a very sure footed car that can really use the power. Around the back of the car, it's a little bit under the radar. There are a few giveaways that we're not exactly driving a 1.1 litre three cylinder non-turbo. I um, mean, this exhaust is a little bit bigger than usual. This is the ProDrive exhaust and the ProDrive exhaust would normally go with the engine. There's a bit of a story with that engine, which I'll come to in a moment. It is debadged. There's nothing on the back to give away what the car is beyond the Subaru badge on the back. And of course the spoiler in silver, it's not as obvious as it would be in bright blue, but it is still quite chunky. Now, getting into the boot, you see the, the key here, or the tag by the driver's footwell, which seems to be so often the case. Inside, the boot's not too bad. It's a typical sort of saloon size boot. There are no lash downs. Oh, there's a light. There's a space saver spare wheel here under the carpet. And the seats don't fold down, so if you want more practicality, you're gonna to have to go to the estate version. Interesting thing though, when they went from the Gen 1 to the Gen 2 car, the saloon became 40 millimeters wider, but the estate only became five millimeters wider, which in Japan puts the estate and saloon versions of the same car into different classification categories. Very odd. 
I will apologise for any crackles. My uh, wireless Go has seen better days. It's had a few thumps and it's making a bit of noise. Right, oh, dear me, it's warm. We're inside the Scooby. The Spec D has apparently a slightly nicer interior than the regular STIs. Because this was the, uh, the luxurious, comfortable one compared to the uh, regular one. Everything else underneath the car is identical. So inside the car, what made it a bit more luxurious? Well, first of all, you can't see it, but there is more sound deadening. Now Subaru are kind of paying lip service to the fact that uh, compared to BMW and Audi, uh, Mercedes, something like that, uh, their cars were not quite as refined, shall we say. They were, they were rip snortingly fast and huge fun, but they didn't have that same kind of level of hush and refinement. So they put more sound deadening in, and that's not the only thing they did. These spec D's also got a complete leather interior. You'll notice the seat back is actually in a one piece thing uh, with a little look through looky hole so you can go peeking through it, which is, I guess, kind of fun. It came with upgraded speakers in the doors, but you can't tell because they're the same standard uh, grills over them. It came with upgraded stereo, but you can't tell because this has got a uh, aftermarket Pioneer in it. Apparently it had touchscreen sat nav as well, but I think they would have gone with the stereo. That would have been a full double din unit, I believe, when it was new. But the rest of it is still regular STI, and a lot of that is regular uh, Subaru Impreza. Impreza. Is that Impreza or Impreza? I've never really known. After 28 years, I still haven't pinned that one down. I could say Vanden Plos, but I can't say Impreza. So let's have a look around and see what we actually have got. On the door top, it's a uh, kind of rubbery elephant skin, black plastic with some black vinyl padded area below. It's a very simple design. They've not gone to great lengths to uh, do fun stuff with it. They've just made it quite functional more than anything else. You do, of course, have a chromey door handle and an individual locking door. Same as on the Toyotas of the early noughties and nineties. Uh, your central locking is on a button down below, but your individual door lock is a big tag above. With this big red stripe showing the car is able to open and the word lock embossed in the plastic to show it's locked. There you go. Now there are twin speakers in this car. I don't know if this is part of the upgrade kit or not, but the main speaker is down the bottom. A little tweeter here by the door handle. Then we have a big panel on the driver's side. We've got the four electric windows, and these are pillarless windows as well. So when you drop these down, you've got a lovely big open space. It's a little bit pointless because there is a beat post in the middle of the car, and you know there's a, there's a roof over the top as well. So it's, I don't know, it's a bit of a gimmick maybe. Maybe it saves weight, I don't know really. But uh, yeah, there you have it. Four pillarless windows with uh, auto drop glass on the driver's finger power drop glass on the other three. And of course, we've got the lockout button and the central locking, which we just discussed. Ahead of that, we have a very big mirror control, a massive joypad and an LR rocker switch to choose which mirror you're adjusting. Then down below that, just a little narrow, very plasticky actually, door bin in the bottom of the door. Now we have the dashboard. Let's start off with the thing we can see through here. This is, oh, big sweep when you turn on, the three big dial uh, binnacle. So in the center, dominating everything, like on a Porsche, we've got our rev counter, revving up to 9,000, redlining at 7,000, and of course it's badged STI in the middle, and it's all glowing red behind with red needles, so it looks very kind of race-inspired, very rrr. When you turn the ignition off, you lose the backlighting, the, the red backlighting lighting that is, and you cannot really see a thing on these dials apart from the needles. The speedo is the round dial on the right, which uh, red lines up at 160, which is only two miles an hour faster than the claimed top speed of the car, 158. And over to the left, we've got the fuel gauge and the temperature gauge in a, two little small sub dials in one matching third chrome or plasticky silver ringed main dial. And of course, we've got a couple other little warnings down here and the one that's showing at the moment I've obviously got the battery warning because I'm sitting here with the ignition on the engine not running rear diff temp red warning light which uh, is interesting I've been parked for about an hour so I don't think that will be on I think it's just a, a check thing oh yeah there is an immobilizer which comes on after a minute or so Ah, now everything's gone out now. Now on top of the steering column, we've got a couple of little add-on things, which I don't know if they're volumetric alarm or if they're air fresheners. They're very curious little things. They may not even be factory, I've no idea. But uh, I think they're maybe just for the alarm system. In between them, there is the parking light switch though, so you can turn on parking lights when the car is parked. Very useful. Then we've got a very Japanesey looking instrument stalk, so typically quite hard, shiny plastic with uh, not a lot of tactility to them, but they feel robust. Um, the left-hand one, indicators obviously, side lights, dip lights. Then there's a brightness gauge for the instrument cluster on the stalk. That's a really unusual placement for that. Five-notch adjustable ring, how curious. On the right-hand side, we've got 
windscreen wipers and screen wash. Now below the adjustable eyeball air vent on the right hand side, we've got a little bank of, well, there's three buttons and one blanked off one. Two of them are very obvious, front and rear fog lights. We know what they are, can't go wrong with that. Third one, intercooler water spray. Oh, so if you're really on it, you can cool down your intercooler with a spray button. This is not something you find on a regular cooking model. And then obviously the blanked off button, which we don't know about. Now over in the center of the dashboard, there's not really a lot going on. It's very, very, very basic and plain. They've really kind of hidden everything or kept everything to a bare minimum in terms of what you have to look at. Uh, the clock is here, kind of concealed in a little kind of top shelf almost. Um, just three buttons for setting an hour a minute and just a little green LED readout. Wow, that's really, really basic. A couple of air vents with the hazard lights in between. Someone's added a traffic master on there. That's not standard. And they've changed the uh, double din head unit for a single din and a little kind of cubby hole with a iPhone hookup. Below that, three little ring dials, all exactly the same sort of plasticky silver color as the dashboard itself for heating and ventilation and air conditioning, all that kind of stuff, um, which flows on down into an ashtray sweet wrapper holder and a 12 volt socket, all very normal very discreet, all very silver. Then you get the gear shift. All these cars shipped with a six speed manual gearbox. Oh, this is a sweet gearbox. This is really, really nice, lovely mechanical feeling thing. Perforated leather, little round gear knob thing. It's, it's perfect for this palm of your hand. Nice to just slop through the gears, ideal. And a phone of the gator as well. And a pretend metal surround as well. So lots of silvery plastic with pretend little Allen keys as well. So it's yeah, bit of a bit of plain pretend, but oh, better than almost anything else on the road. So we'll we'll give it a free pass for that. Then we've got a very interesting button down here, the C diff menu button. Now C diff menu. Now the C diff is the DCCD or driver centered control differential. Now by default it's on automatic but you can push the button and move adjust a wheel next to it and this is how progressive, how aggressive, how much power goes front and back. The car does this so well it's really not particularly useful unless you're actually on a racetrack or something and really pushing the car very hard indeed. But there it is you can really take full control of the car. Uh, behind that we've got two things of note. First of all, the handbrake is a nice proper mechanical manual handbrake. I don't like automatic electric ones, they're very annoying. This is good. Um, great for handbrake turns because it's a hooligan car, obviously. Uh, then we've got two fairly good sized cup holders. Ideal for your furious driving mug, available in all good furious driving stores. Um, and we can quickly check the T-shelf situation here. Uh, yeah, this is a good car for a picnic. You can take this on a rally stage somewhere. Heavy sandwiches that'll be uh, made at home and wrapped up in foil or cling film because you've gone to a rally somewhere and that's the kind of practical person you are. Um, so yes, this is a good car for out, out and about activities. Behind our cup holders we have got a little plastic uh, cubby hole thing as well, little center armrest gubbins. So yes, a little bit of practicality. Not much more in here, a couple of uh, sun visors, a couple of reading lights and a center light in the middle. Oh, and a glove box of course, which is big the front of the car. Let's have a look in the back. Oh, well the rear doors uh, don't open particularly wide but once you're in the space isn't too bad. It's got okay knee room, there's sort of okay toe room but it's a weird kind of thing where the ankles are getting the brunt. Your, your toes and your knees are fine but your ankles are being compressed and this one piece seat does kind of come into your face a wee bit as well so it's okay for smaller kids, not great for adults on a long journey I would, I would suggest. If you're going to Nürburgring Trunk cool shotgun if you're not driving. The leather seats are quite comfortable. There is a pull down armrest which does give you access into the boot. That's the only um, fold down option there is just here. A door handle, a lock, a window, and a door pull. That's literally it. Oh, speaker. There's no seat back stowage, there's no door bins. It's all very much focused on the people in the front of the car as far as things to keep you interested go. Right, let's take this thing out for a little drive. Well, that noise is just unique to these cars, isn't it? At slow speed, you are getting all the power just delivered very smoothly. You know the car has got lots more. It's just giving it to you in a nice, sensible, restrained manner. But get on the road. It's 
so I had to slow down a second because I thought for a second a GoPro had fallen off the side of the car. But um, you can break the law in second gear. I mean, it's just insane the amount of potential, the acceleration. It's just ridiculous on this car. And it's so much fun doing it as well. But the gear change on this thing, it's like a little rifle bolt. It's so sharp and accurate, it feels beautifully kind of smooth and mechanical. It's like a Rover from the 1950s or 60s, it's that good. And the car's got a ton of power to go with it as well. Now this car has quite an interesting history. It was bought by the current owner with a blown engine, which unfortunately isn't that uncommon. So a donor engine was bought, and that donor is actually quite a celebrity. Uh, if you've seen the Kingsman movie, Kingsman 2, where they uh, borrow a yellow Impreza STI, and then do a bunch of donuts, and then get chased by the police through the streets of London, this engine came from that car. So, as we said, in standard form, these cars have got about 280 horsepower. I don't know if this car has been breathed on or not. It feels insanely quick. And it's got the ProDrive exhaust, which is adding a little bit of extra sparkle to the burble already. But um, it's possible because the, you can't generally get the ProDrive exhaust without the kit on the engine as well. This may well have ProDrive parts in the engine too, but we just don't know. It certainly feels like a 300 horsepower car, that's for sure. But at low speed, it's just a pussycat. It's just it's such an easy car to just drive and enjoy. It's only really when you drop a gear or two and let it loose, it's just, oh, this thing comes alive, it's mad. The thing is, of course, this is still a rally car at heart. So even in its most civilized form, it is quite a hard ride. Speed bumps aren't your friend. Now the car puts its power down through what Subaru calls symmetrical all-wheel drive, and that means it finds wherever the grip is and sends it there. And that means this thing is insanely sure-footed. I was heading out to a dual carriageway so I can actually uh, give a bit of proper acceleration and see what this thing will really do. Well, not really do, up to about 60 miles an hour. This thing is just so grippy, it's ridiculous. might be discrete silver but they are still pretty wide and they're shot in some decent grippy tires as well. Stopping is not a problem either, it's got big vented discs on all four wheels. A Subaru may not build interiors that are BMW or Audi like in their level of refinement and quality but they can build a car that is so entertaining and so engaging it's like nothing else. It's got McPherson struts and coils at the front. It's got trailing arms with regular dampers and at the back, anti-roll bars front and rear. Now, spec D does not mean anything like initial D. This is not a cartoon. This is reality. It really is as fast as this. And the interesting thing about this car is it's got all the same potential as a regular STI, but without the blue paint, without the badges on the back, it really does blend into traffic really well. When you have, when you're in a you know full-on regular Subaru, when you're in a full-on regular STI, people really clock you in traffic. They either give they either give you a knowing look, a smile, a nod because they know what you're driving and they they like it, or they give you a slightly disapproving look because you know how dare you, etc. But in this thing, you are very much under the radar. There's only a few people out there who will know that you're driving something with utter devastating road potential. The kind of thing that can lap the Nürburgring in 10 minutes without even breaking a sweat. And you're going down to Sainsbury's in it. <laughs> what a waste. <laughs> this car actually belongs to a friend of mine and it's going to be for sale fairly shortly. Um, there'll be a link in the description below with his email in it if you're interested. Drop him a line. He's not decided if he really wants to sell it. 
He sort of wants to sell and sort of doesn't, and I know what he means, because if I had this car, I wouldn't want to sell it. But at the same time, it's ridiculous and a license loser. But I do love it a lot. I wonder how much he's asking for. I'm quite tempted myself. Well, thanks for joining me today in this wonderful Impreza Spec D. and subscribe to the sharing on Facebook and all the usual stuff. You know what to do, blah, blah, blah. I'll see you again next time in something completely different. Ta-da!